Book Summary of Walter Schellenberg By Walter Schellenberg This is a chilling memoir by the head of Hitler's Foreign Intelligence Service. And so by the time I was 12 or 13, my mother told me about her father. And uh, that uh, my father was, you know, a very high-ranking Nazi and um, and sort of what he did and um, and she said that you know you're now this age and when you find out about what you know sort of his past you know you can get very very um, you know excited it's very exciting and there's a lot of stories about it but there's also um, you know you always have to think about in in which context all of this happened so she gave me his memoirs which uh, uh, were published uh, in 19, I think, 59 or 58 or something like that, um, and uh, have been uh, doing quite well. And, and sort of as a as a as a history of all the people involved in this in the in the police states and uh, and, and 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 the SS and so forth. So there's a kind of an accurate account there, and 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 due to that has been very very uh, popular with historians and so forth and people that are interested in that time period. So um, I read through that and uh, found out, well, you know, it's, it, it's sort of like who he was and uh, what he has done and, um, and decided to go a little bit further into it and, and try to figure out what was going on and tried to contact my f the family members uh, on my mother's side with no success whatsoever. Um, tried to get, you know, transcripts, tried to get letters, tried to get uh, um, uh, photographs and so forth. And, uh, and was pretty much confronted with denial, uh, in a sense that it wasn't a denial saying like this never happened, but it happened, but we don't want to talk about it. It's just not, you know. Um, so um, found out from my mother that she you know, after finding out herself in the 50s who, what was going on and, you know, the, the, Germany was turning around and, and that if you would say, if she would say her name, everybody was like, you're not the daughter of this and the Schellenberg and yeah, that's, that's me. And, uh, you know, it was very difficult to, uh, to sort of uh, get around. So she actually emigrated to the United States herself and then returned in 1979 with me and my siblings, my two sisters, back to Germany and, uh, obviously with my father's name, Koenig. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, I immediately was, was confronted with that uh, sort of, uh, you know, there's no way that uh, you're going to get any information from us. And, uh, you know, excited as I was at being a 13-year-old, I think that uh, my uncles and aunts were probably going, you know, you shouldn't be excited about this. And uh, as far as I know, um, and there's some rumors that are going to interest you, but uh, as far as I know, from my mother, I mean, he was born in Saarbrücken, near the French border in 1910, uh, and, uh, and died in 1952 in Italy, in Trento. He reached the peak of his, uh, of his uh, sort of uh, career in 1945, at age 36, he was chief of intelligence, um, uh, which at the time was kind of in shambles. The, it was the so-called Reichssicherheitshauptamt, RSHA, uh, which was partially run by Kaltenbrunner, who was on one of the, f the first, um, uh, one of the 20 defendants on the first trial, and I think was sentenced to death. Um, uh, who ran, I think, Amt 1 and 2. My grandfather held the position of Amt 4 since 1940, I think, mm -hmm. or 39, which was the, um, the Office of Counterintelligence. He was a lawyer and he went to law school in Bonn and uh, decided that he would be interested in foreign services. 1933, in order to do this, you're going to have to, you know, uh, um, enter the Nazi party. Hitler just got to power. Everything was turning around. He said, you know, he, he, uh, it seemed he, that Hitler was the only realist in, in what that was going on and he was following his, uh, his political ideas and he thought that this kind of the, 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 the extreme you know, side, the radical, radical side of his policies would kind of tame down in the moment he became power and actually had to run the country and so forth. And he thought that you know, this was the party to sign up with and did so in 1933 and became a member of the SS um, as, you know, in order to become, sort of, into, get into the close uh, uh, knit group of, of, of Nazi uh, um, uh, 
intelligence and or whatsoever. Uh, polit politics, uh, you had to be a member of one of the elite groups, SA or SS. Obviously, the SA shortly after disbanded or was disbanded by the SS. And, uh, and so he decided to become a member of the SS, and it went from there. Probably one of the key figures in his career was Heydrich. Uh, the two of them were very close friends. Uh, in his book, he tried to withdraw from that, but according to my mother, the family, the two families were very, very close. Heydrich was a had conspiracy theories left and right, and uh, and was very afraid of, uh, of of being, you know, spotted by Meyer and uh, Kaltenbrunner and so forth. All these kind of the brutal, the Gestapo uh, side of it, and 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 Heydrich pride proud you know pride himself with being in an uh, you know an intellectual and uh, and uh, you know being sort of like you know much more superior to that and uh, and Schellenberg seemed to fit into that you know they were not the sloppy you know overweight uh, guys that were like you know screaming propaganda but those were the smart spies that were really running the show and and sort of you know it's always described as the backroom boys you know that 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 sat in the room and really figured out what was going on um, and uh, the, I believe the, the relationship between Heydrich and Hitler was very kind of a dubious one. You know, like uh, Heydrich always thought that Hitler was kind of a bit of a, um, you know, he didn't really know what he was doing, and, and, and most of the time, you know, his decision came just sort of like, you know, by, you know, being enraged or whatever. And, um, and so, uh, hearing the or, or, or reading or, or hearing about uh, the conversations between Heydrich and uh, and uh, and Schellenberg they seem to so somehow try to you know um, create a certain SD security dienst uh, that uh, or security service that um, that set itself apart a little bit and that didn't have to answer to Himmler as chief of SS or Hitler as you know the, the Führer and so forth so that seemed to be a key figure that I, you know, that I researched through family members that, that seemed to be elementary in, in Schellenberg's uh, career. Here's two other rumors. And this is all things that my mother said, like, you know, look, uh, this is something that was carried, you know, historians interviewing her and so forth, uh, uh, brought up every now and then. Um, Canaris, who was, you know, um, I think a Navy man, I'm not sure. Um, he was uh, the chief of intelligence, and, and, and I think that Schalberg really regarded him as, as a very um, intelligent man and uh, somebody he had looked up to. And, uh, and I believe that it was, well, this is again something that I heard, and I'm not sure whether this is, can be proven or so, but I heard that Schalberg was the one who actually outed. Uh, Canars and 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 he was the one who actually executed Canars, which I could never you know um, sort of like you know through historical documents you could never prove or figure out or something like that. But that's another thing that I've heard uh, uh, from my mother. What had uh, basically sort of become apparent again, this is according to my mother, is that my grandfather became extremely involved in being powerful and he was very um, keen on you know at one point it shifted and you know and, and, and he was just sort of lusting for power and uh, and didn't really care to uh, didn't mind to you know step over bodies for that mm -hmm. I think that this shift somehow appeared I think Heydrich died in uh, 1943 or 44 he was assassinated, wasn't he? He was assassinated yes and uh, and after that, it seemed like you know, Sch Schaumburg, uh was at the at that point where like okay, now everything or nothing, you know. And he was he was again he was very young. He was thirty five years old, and uh, <clears throat> probably thinking if the regime holds up, um, you know, that he could you know ultimately hold the top post. And uh, um, funny enough, while this was going on. He was probably one of the m most connected people towards other governments, you know, the Swiss government, the British government. He was very respectful of other spy services, other, you know, intelligence services. Held a lot of contacts and, uh, and recruited one of his, you know, gifts were to recruit spies for the Germans. <clears throat> he was, uh, you know, whether it was uh, 
the uh, operation, uh, you know, in Russia where they uh, parachuted the uh, the Russian prisoners of war that they, you know, transformed into German spies. I forgot what it was called. Sol uh, operation uh, Solomon or something like that. And, um, you know, that was sort of like his world, you know, the, the, uh, whether the Venlo incident, I mean, there's some very famous ones, the, you know, the, the, where he was uh, hired to kidnap the, the, the Duke and the Duchess of Windsor and so forth, uh, Hitler, you know, which are, to him seemed completely uh, outrageous uh, things. And he actually didn't do it because he fell ill of uh, food poisoning which I think is a complete, uh, you know, I mean, he didn't fall ill of food poisoning. He claimed that the British uh, uh, tried to kill him and tried to um, uh, basically poison him. But I think that that was just a front in order to get out of this kind of a completely ridiculous task of, of, of kidnapping the Duke and the Duchess. So this is sort of these little stories that, that one sort of hears here and there. Yep. He goes into that in his memoir a little bit. You know, he doesn't want to... It seems like the memoir, which was written, I think, in the late 40s, while he was in captivity, he was sort of not touching the most, you know, he was, he was basically putting himself as an intelligence man, and uh, that he served his country, and, um, and he was sort of stepping away from these atrocities that were committed by the Nazi general, the, the uh, Nazi uh, um, uh, regime. Uh, without going into, you know, sort of details. I think that he was very aware, for instance, of the Wannsee um, conference, which was about the final, you know, the solution of the final question, uh, of the, uh, the final solution of the Jewish question and so forth, connection with Himmler and so forth. He, it almost seemed like sort of he would go into that in terms of like, you know, I knew that things were not going the way they were going and, you know, I needed to make peace and we wanted to have peace and we wanted, we didn't want the, uh, the craziness of Hitler anymore and uh, that Himmler, you know, had, uh, had basically, uh, you know, thought him, uh, sought him out as a, as, a, as, a, as a person to basically negotiate a truce. But um, Schellenberg, knowing you know quite well that he was on very thin ice there, that if something somehow didn't work out or was leaking out, that Himmler would have him killed right away, and um, you know, there's a lot of sides to that. There is this, there was this thing that was going around that you know Schellenberg did not die in um, in Italy. Then again, my mother said that he was very, very sick. He, she remembered him. They would, they would visit him in Italy in, in captivity and in, shortly after there. Um, and she said that, that he was telling her that he was not going to live very long and that he uh, that he's, feels uh, very ill and so forth. And that they, you know, basically they said their goodbyes. There's, there's the two, the House of Windsor and Count Bernadotte are the two royal families that somehow were elementary in keeping my family after my grandfather went to prison and died, um, keeping them alive. My mother never, my grandmother never worked. She was, she just raised, you know, basically my mother and I believe three siblings. Funny enough, I don't even know how many uncles and aunts I have because of this, because of this kind of cut in the family. My, my grandmother, my mother, was um, one of the decisions, or what, what made her decide to leave Germany at the age of 15, 16, besides being, you know, you know, being mixed up emotionally, was that my grandmother never excused, uh, never, you know, apologized or, or um, admitted the wrongdoing of my grandfather. She said that he was a military man, that he was a, a master thinker, that, uh, you know, in, in, in this, in this um, world of Nazi, uh, um, the Nazi regime, that, that he basically, uh, if he would have run it, he would have, you know, everything would have been just fine, and so forth. So, uh, my grandmother never, you know, admitted the wrongdoings, but, um, but I, she said that, you know, my grandmother was, was flying around the world a lot and uh, my mother went with her in the first, uh, you know, since she was maybe like 11 or 12 up until she was 16 and visited 
the Count Bernardot and so forth, who were very close with my grandfather. My grandfather had very, very close relationship. My grandmother, for instance, knew about an affair that my grandfather had, uh, a very close affair for about two years with Coco Chanel. Yet behind the ruthlessly manicured public image lies a tale of wartime collaboration with the Nazis and a lifetime of disastrous affairs. Always a mistress, never a wife. Coco's longing for love nearly cost her everything. That Coco Chanel, and this is obviously something that aren't, is not that well known, but you know, documented in, in various German ministries, Coco Chanel was a spy for the Germans. He recruited Coco Chanel as a, as a spy. She was a Nazi sympathizer, which was known, as were the Windsors to a certain degree. The House of Windsors were Nazi sympathizers um, in, in their ideology, so to speak. Gabriel Coco Chanel was a Nazi agent with a specific ID number working for the German military intelligence agency. And so these kind of connections somehow kept, you know, going after my grandfather's death. So that the Count of Bernadotte, as well as the House of Windsors, basically had finance, had a stipend for my, fam for my grandmother's fi family to, to live until, you know, my grandmother died, which was, I think, in 1975 or 76. That's such an extraordinary story. <laughs> And I mean, the, the spy stories are, are quite amazing. My mother, um, I, you know, once visited uh, my aunt. She showed me my grandfather's ring, which, uh, you know, was a, 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 the, a seal <coughs> of uh, a German group of knights. I forgot exactly what it was, but it was basically the uh, Sianit uh, ring that he carried all the time. He had, you know, poison on him at all times, um, as he was constantly in, in foreign territory. And it's cyanide. Cyanide. cyanide, oh yeah, I'm sorry. And, um, and then if, you know, there's about his missions, there's probably about a good 25, 30 missions. Operation Barbarossa was the name that I was uh, trying to remember. The Venlo incident, which is probably one of the most known and most documented incidents where he captured two SIS uh, spies uh, of the British intelligence. Um, the uh, book that he written called Invasion 1940, which was a handbook given out to uh, the commanders that were going to invade Britain about the immediate invasion of Britain in 1940. That is actually translated into English as well and available on Barnes & Noble, which I didn't know. Um, there is what is described is basically the um, habits of Britons from Boy Scouts to intelligence services from you know their eating habits to uh, so he researched all of that and really down to the detail told you know the SS uh, uh, leaders how to behave and how to tell their soldiers to behave once they invade Britain you know, to make Britain their own right away. And um, it actually was, uh, once that was uh, published, 1945, once the Britons actually, the Brits saw the, uh, the publication, um, they tried to literally burn every copy that was and tried to get rid of it because it was such an accurate, detailed description of their, of their security services at the time that it was a big embarrassment for, uh, for them, you know, to have an enemy <coughs> uh, foreign intelligence officer being that aware mm -hmm. of uh, the, uh, the goings and political ongoings and so forth in Britain. So that's the second book that's around, and I, uh, uh, September 2003, which uh, I guess, you know, within this month, uh, there's uh, the pub a big publication coming out, a hardcover publication called the uh, the um, Allied interrogation of Walter Schallenberg, um, Hitler's, you know, chief of da 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 da. Uh, that's being published this month, which I haven't heard of. And uh, by yesterday, going online to uh, Amazon, just typing in the name, this book came up as like, you know, you can buy it now and get it delivered sometime within this month. And uh, it seems like a solid book, a big book. And uh, so I'm very curious what that is going to. Yeah, I think so. It's your grandfather. What that's going to uh, to produce? 100, 120 spies that just answered to him. 
that he manipulated, you know, that he formed, that he recruited, and uh, that he partially trained, and uh, that the uh, SS trained, and and so uh, and that would answer to him, and nobody even would know about it. So you know, Heydrich would be let in into that every now and then, but he sort of created this small personal army operating out of Turkey, Spain, England, Russia, France, and uh, he would just literally go and meet and, uh, and travel around to, to, uh, to, to sort of keep up with, uh, with, with these spies. And the amount of information that came out of him, he was such a, he was really not very well liked in, 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 in the, uh, in the uh, high command from Himmler, uh, besides Heydrich, from Himmler to Kaltenbrunner to Meyer to um, uh, 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 to Hitler, who who sort of had a you know just a um, he 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 seemed too intelligent to them. He too you know like as they would call it, sort of a wise ass, you know, and um, and it's being described as such, and 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 so everybody was very careful around him around Heydrich as they seemed um, uh, extremely, you know, they took, you know, their matter very, very personal. Which obviously, you know, led into so much more terror and so much more, as you said, you know, the henchmen that, you know, essentially it was Heydrich who finalized the distinct, you know, the, 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 the execution of, of, you know, after that point, probably four and a half million people. So you know, um, if you if you if you think about you know Schallenberg and Heydrich doing that together, and then reading a book where you know the spy stories were told, you know you read it and you think of James Bond, uh, the kind of manipulation that goes on up until the t till the end, up until his death, where he would not even touch on the matter of 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 you know the solution of the final question, uh, the final solution of the, uh, the Jewish question and, and, and things like that, it seems to me quite uh, outrageous and quite, you know, de, uh, you know, deranged almost, you know. And so it's, it's, there is this intrigue and there is this very, very sort of curious, like, you know, like you're reading this book and you're thinking this is, this is ten movies. But, uh, but then the kind of context that it falls into and the kind of atrocities that were committed and, you know, his ability to manipulate people and his, you know, with, with, without any problem, you know, basically being able to execute whoever he wanted to or had executed everybody, you know, it, you know, obviously being, you know, the secret police and, you know, being able to influence the Gestapo just as much. Uh, there's a lot of untold stories, you know, that you, uh, that you, that I think one needs to dig out just as much as the very interesting and intriguing relations with foreign, serv with foreign services of other states. Uh, that my grandfather immediately realized that the Americans were really in charge of this uh, tribunal. Uh, he was obviously in touch <coughs> with the Brits a lot more, but, um, but seemed to realize that, you know, it was the Americans that were going to, you know, shape this trial and uh, immediately tried to basically, you know, at first he, uh, the very final moments of the, of the war, he sort of prides himself with um, freeing thousands of Jews that were destined to go to Auschwitz where he actually um, transferred the trains to Switzerland. Uh, once I found out about that, uh, I researched that a little bit more and found out that um, that he actually sold uh, these trains to Switzerland. So uh, his contacts in Switzerland said, like, you know, we need so and so many million Reichmarks in gold for you to receive, you know, these 8,000 uh, um, Jewish uh, prisoners. A lot of it has to do with, you know, sort of his manipulation of the truth. Defendants in case number 11, now pending before this tribunal. Walter Schellenberg, how plead you to this indictment? Guilty or not guilty? Nicht schuld. That is, that is probably one of the sides that is most interesting to, to really 
discover and, 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 and research. And I think this book, you know, The Airlight Interrogation, if, it, if they make a whole book about it, it must be, you know, more than a 10-page affidavit that I found. Right. So that could be a very interesting uh, document as to who he, had, he was in touch with. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, the uh, Chief Justice uh, Jackson had, you know, an elementary, uh, you know, role, played a role in that.